for you to focus on the Caribbean or Africa with China without recognizing the role that China is playing in Europe or in the North Atlantic countries is a bit disingenuous and really reflects more that we are seen as pawns, regrettably, rather than countries with equal capacity to determine our destiny and to be part and parcel of that global conversation to fight the global issues of the day like climate and the pandemic. What's up, people? Welcome back to Dropping Bars, the Inside the Mind edition. I am Kimron Korean, and today I am taking you inside the mind of the Honorable Mia Amord Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados. Here are six life lessons you can learn from Mia Motley. What is Barbados hoping to achieve when it becomes a republic? To be able to settle for our citizens once and for all that they do not and will not be inferior to anyone on this earth. We have for too long had to accept the fact that a head of state of this country is somebody who we don't choose. We have no say in how they're appointed and it causes us to feel in many instances that there are two sets of people. Um, we hope to bring this to an end and we hope that it will give the confidence and the sense of high self-esteem that our citizens need in order to be able to be more productive and in order to be able to chart our own destiny. When you look at our history and how we got here, then you realize that having a head of state who is a non-Barbadian is an anachronism that this country can no longer afford to carry. And secondly, that we use this opportunity to be able to set the tone and to create the framework for establishing once and for all who we want to be and what we want to stand for. And that requires, in my view, not just form, but substance. And to that extent, therefore, we're not only changing the head of state, we hope to be able to start a discussion for a new constitution, but a new constitution that looks at the different roles, responsibilities, and indeed um, rights of citizens. But before you even get there, I think we need to settle a document that says, look, this is who we are. This is what we stand for. And on our own journey here as a government, we did something similar in 2016 with a covenant of hope. We want to be able to let people know that nation building is not a passive act. It is very much an active entity. And if it is active, then we need to know who we are and what we stand for. Look correctly, I think the Chinese hold a large, large percentage of assets within the United States of America and a large amount of their treasuries as well. So for you to focus on the Caribbean or Africa with China without recognizing the role that China is playing in Europe or in the North Atlantic countries is a bit disingenuous and really reflects more that we are seen as pawns, regrettably, rather than countries with equal capacity to determine our destiny and to be part and parcel of that global conversation to fight the global issues of the day like climate and the pandemic. The choice of my public life has been to be a lawyer, an advocate, as well as to be a representative of the people. And I say representative as opposed to politician because I believe that I'm here to represent the interests and the voices. And there's so many who are voiceless and there's so many who are incapable of action. But if those of us who have the capacity can make that difference in their lives, then the world would be a better place. Every generation before us has seen the challenges and has resolved that they need to step up to them. Four years ago, when I first came to New York as Prime Minister to speak at Anger, I said that the world regrettably looked too much like it did 100 years ago. I didn't know then that we were going to see the Spanish flu again in the form of the pandemic. I didn't know then that we would see war in Europe again. I didn't know then that we would continue to have an imperialistic outlook to both finance and institutional reform globally. And we have now reached a point where we cannot take it anymore and where people are suffering, people are dying as a result of our failure to act. Our voices need to rise up. And I'm not just talking about the global voices of the South, I'm talking about people everywhere. We have the collective capacity to transform. 
We're in the country that built pyramids. We know what it is to remove slavery from our civilization. We know what it is to be able to find a vaccine within two years when a pandemic hits us. We know what it is to put a man on the moon and now we put in Rover on Mars. We know what it is. But the simple political will that is necessary, not just to come here and make promises, but to deliver on them and to make a definable difference in the lives of the people who we have a responsibility to serve seem still not to be capable of being produced. If there's one thing that I'd like to see coming out of this is a global leadership initiative. Look, 75 years ago, the United Nations was formed on the 24th of October. We used the opportunity of post-World War II to create a number of vital institutions to be able to bring countries together to protect the most vulnerable, the weakest among us. We also used it to create the Bretton Woods institutions, which we're relying on. But we need to repurpose these organizations and in having a global leadership initiative, make sure that we are really reacting to what is real. We are told that we can access concessional funding or grant funding only if we have historic per capita incomes that are below certain levels. Well, Christian, that is like telling me that I should use my blood pressure reading from two years ago to determine whether I'm vulnerable tonight to a stroke. It's absolutely futile. And we've been carrying on this um, thesis and argument for over 30 years. We also had problems when the WTO was formed. We recognized, for example, that much of our domestic production would shut down and it would make us more open. When we had 9-11, we had other issues that were imposed on us on a one-size-fits-all prescription. Now we have this pandemic. We need global leadership similar to what we had post-World War II to become to be able to recognize that we need a plan that protects not just the strongest among us, but also the most vulnerable. And what should we mm -hmm. really be spending money on? Do we make, does it make sense to continue to build large military constructs when as a result of a mosquito or a pandemic, our populations can be put at risk? It doesn't make any sense.